Today we're going to compare the Testament of Solomon to the Lord of the Rings. When we're done, you'll be convinced that the concept for the Lord of the Rings came from Solomon's story and how he commanded the 72 demons with the use of a stone ring given to him by the Archangel Michael. The Testament of Solomon tells us that the seal of the ring was made of stone, a precious stone. And this whole story started when a worker on the temple was approached by Solomon and asked why he was so frail when he was being given double wages. The boy replied to Solomon, said it was because a demon was stealing his wages and sucking his thumb at night and basically drawing away all of his power. Look at this screenshot from Lord of the Rings where Gollum has just bit off Frodo's finger. Gollum essentially sucks the finger of Frodo just like the demon did to the boy, stealing his power. But the connections don't end there. Gollum's fate is sealed when he catches the ring into his chest before falling into the fire. Well, Solomon used the ring to throw it into the chest of the demons as well in the Testament of Solomon. Now, the ring had a stone pentalpha, it's called, as I said earlier. So you need to wonder, is this why the devil inverts the star as his symbol of evil? This is the pentalpha. This is what it looks like. It's said to be a simple five-pointed star. Some believe it is the symbol of Israel's flag that is the actual symbol on the ring. But it's hard to tell since we don't have the ring today. But the point is that the Testament of Solomon says that the seal was stone. And it also calls stones precious. Just like Gollum's number one catchphrase in the Lord of the Rings films. So Solomon prays to have the demon brought before him who is plaguing his artisan, sucking away all of his energy. And Michael brings him the ring. Solomon then gives it, to, uh, gives it to the boy to capture the demon. Solomon then goes on to capture 72 total demons. Now in the Lord of the Rings films, the ring actually has an inscription on it. And the inscription is, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them all, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. Doesn't this sound like the binding of all these demons of the Goetia, the 72 demons that Solomon bound with this ring? And just like in the Testament of Solomon, the ring changes hands several times. Goes from the angel, Archangel Michael, to Solomon, then to the boy, then to the first demon, and then to the second demon. Each time sticking it into their chest. Now this is where the plot thickens. The first thing that Solomon tells the first demon is to cut stone. Now are you ready for this? The Bible mentions two stones that were in the breastplate of the priests in Exodus and Samuel. The breastplate of the priests of the Israelites. The stones were used to determine guilt or innocence. This is right out of Exodus. In the Bible, these two stones are called the Uman and Thuman. And yes, it sounds a lot like Uma Thurman, which is why I think she got her name. And the Uman and the Thuman stand for light and perfection. The first letters of Uman and Thuman are the Aleph and the Tav. And when you superimpose the Aleph upon the Tav, you get this seal, this star, this five-pointed star that was on the Ring of Solomon. This is unbelievable. No one has found this yet. How can this be? Now, for your own research, it is said that the Urum can cut through solid objects and the Thuman can levitate 
those objects. Now all of this of course is through the power of God. Not something you can do alone without calling on the name of God. But this is stone cutting and the moving of those stones to build temples, which is exactly what Solomon used the ring for. This is unbelievable. In the next part of this series, we're going to look at how the story of Star Wars was based on similar Salomonic concepts. And this, these, these aren't good things that they're depicting this in the mainstream. This is a form of sorcery that they're waging upon humanity. Because if it wasn't sorcery, they would have told us where they got these concepts from. But they've twisted the concepts to their own devices, pushing the left-right paradigm through their media and using these ancient stories to do it. Take care and be safe, you guys. They claim to have discovered the secrets of Suleiman. What secrets of Suleiman? How he controlled the jinn and the animals. We all should know, uh, those of us that have studied a little bit of Islam, that Suleiman was given something that nobody else was given. We know this. Suleiman was given something that no other prophet was given, no other person was given. And that's what the dua he made to Allah. Oh Allah, give me a power. Mulk here doesn't just mean a kingdom. It means the power, the mulukiyya, the, the kingdom or the control that no one after me will have. So Allah says, because of his dua, we gave him the power of the wind. فَسَخَرْنَ لَهُ الرِّيحَ Right? تَجْبِ أَمْرِ الرُّخَانِ حَيْثُ أَصَابْ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ We gave him the power of the shayateen. And in other verses, we gave him the power to speak to animals. So the animals, And all of the armies of Sulaiman, from the jinn and the ins and the birds, all of these are armies of Sulaiman. So Sulaiman was given the power to control the jinn. Okay, and even the animals and the wind. It is said that after Sulaiman died, or according to one opinion, even while he was alive, the shayateen claimed to have unlocked his power. What was the power according to the shayateen? The shayateen said, Sulaiman knows black magic. So he's controlling the jinn through sihr, through black magic. Then Allah defends Sulaiman. Wama kafara Sulaiman. Sulaiman did not commit kufr. Rather, it was the shayateen who committed kufr. Now, the verse is very difficult to understand without context. The story goes as follows. It is said that during the time of Sulaiman, that somehow they managed to catch him at a time of neglect or whatever, and they started slandering and spreading rumors about him so that people lose respect for Sulaiman. And of the things that they said was that Sulaiman is a magician and that he controls the jinn through sihr. And Allah says, some of the modern Yahud believe this as well. And they're instead of following the Quran, they're following the shayateen. Then Allah defends Sulaiman. Sulaiman was not a kafir. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. This shows us that practicing magic makes you a kafir. Because the jinns accuse Sulaiman of being a magician, not of being a kafir. And Allah defended Sulaiman by saying, He didn't say Sulaiman was not a magician. Rather, Allah said Sulaiman did not commit kufr. And from this, the scholars have derived that practicing magic is disbelief in Allah. It was the shayateen who committed kufr. How did they commit kufr? Yu'allimoon al nas as sihr. They were the ones teaching mankind sihr. Sulaiman did not control the jinns through magic. How did Sulaiman control the jinns? Allah gave him the power. Allah subjugated the jinn, not magic.